Understood psychologically, these texts refer to a transfer or translation from the temporal personal life of the ego to the eternal archetypal realm, presumably the essential accomplishments of egohood, its total of accumulated consciousness, is deposited by means of a final sublimatio in the collective archetypal treasury of humanity. Jung seems to be saying the same thing in describing the visions he had when on the verge of death. I had the feeling that everything was being sloughed away. Nevertheless, something remained. It was as if I now carried along with me everything I had ever experienced or done, everything that had happened around me. I consisted, it, I consisted of my own history, and I felt with great certainty, this is what I am." Unquote. A man's dream shortly before his death presents a similar idea. Quote, I have been set a task nearly too difficult for me. A log of hard and heavy wood lies covered in the forest. I must uncover it, saw or hew from it a circular piece, and then carve through the piece a design. The result is to be preserved at all cost, as representing something no longer recurring and in danger of being lost. At the same time, a taped recording is to be made describing in detail what it is, what it represents, its whole meaning. At the end, the thing itself and the tape are to be given to the public library. Some way, someone says that only the library will know how to prevent the tape from deteriorating within five years." Unquote. The dream was accompanied by a drawing of the circular piece that looked like this. And so here's the circular piece and the drawing that the man made. So he was basically cutting a coin out of a log and then cutting out this star pattern. And um, going on, I understand the dream is referring to the deposit of an individual's life effort into a collective or transpersonal treasury, the library. The carved object and the tape recording can be considered equivalent since the drawing of the object looks exactly like a reel of recording tape. This would suggest that the difficult task involves the transformation of wood into word, i.e. matter, into spirit. Based on the communion of saints, Catholic theology has elaborated the idea of a treasure of merits which have been accumulated by the lives of Christ and the saints. A Catholic theologian writes, quote, if merit properly so-called is not directly communicable between members of the Christian society, at least satisfaction can be transferred, almost as a man can pay a friend's debt. The infinite satisfaction of our Lord and of the superabundant satisfaction of the Virgin Mary and the saints form a treasure which the, guard, the church guards and administers, drawing upon it for the payment of the debts remitted to the faithful by indulgences. This, uh, unquote, this theological myth can now be understood as an early formulation marred by concretistic misapplications, indulgences, of the historical process whereby the psychic accomplishments of individuals are transferred to the collective archetypal psyche. The new myth postulates that no authentic consciousness achieved by the individual is lost. Each increment augments the collective treasury. This will be the modern, more modest version of the idea of having an immortal soul. I would, I would just uh, mention again that uh, when Notre Dame burned, I although I'm not a Catholic, when I saw it burning, um, I was extremely moved. I'm just seeing if I have it here. Um, you know, the image is not available. But <clears throat> when I saw it burning, I sobbed, and I didn't know why, really, because I'm not a Catholic. Um, but 
In any case, I sobbed and I was quite moved by the fire. And a week later, I realized that nothing that Notre Dame represents, and I think it means in this treasure house of the human psyche, um, was lost. That We lost uh, some brick and mortar and we lost uh, some wood carved by individuals of old. Um, but their effort allowed that to be imprint, imprinted on the hearts of millions. And none of that is lost. Um, and so something in the physical world was lost, but nothing from the treasury. And so Notre Dame will be rebuilt once again, but the, what Notre Dame represented in the in the physical world uh, or what it represents in the physical world is really something that's in the transpersonal world and therefore is not um, not damaged at all <clears throat> going on Milton seems to be dealing with the same idea in this passage of Lycidas Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise, the last infirmity of noble mind, to scorn delights and live laborious days, but the fair garden, when we hope to find and think to burst out into sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with its abhorred shears and slits the thin spun life, but not the praise, Phoebus replied, and touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soul. Or, I'm sorry. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor in the glistening, glistering foil, set off to the world, nor in broad rumor lies, but lives and spreads aloft to those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove. As he pronounces lastly on each deed of so much fame, in heaven expect thy meed. <clears throat> okay. Fame, as here used by Milton, corresponds to those fruits of the eagle life, which are translated to the eternal realm and are deposited in the collective soul. Such a fame does not grow in mortal soil, i.e., does not depend on being known by men, but exists in heaven, the archetypal realm. Fame of this sort corresponds to Milton's description of a good book, the precious lifeblood of a master spirit, embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. The fact that our age is a time of death and rebirth for a central myth is indicated by the dreams and upheavals from the unconscious of many individuals. Depth, psycho depth psychotherapists who work with the products of the unconscious are in a unique position to observe the turmoil of the collective psyche. Ap apocalyptic imagery is not uncommon. <clears throat> Here is one remarkable example of such a dream. Quote, I am walking along what appears to be the Palisades overlooking all of New York City. <clears throat> I am walking with a woman who is unknown to me personally. We are both being led by a man who is our guide. New York City is in a rubble. The world, in fact, has been destroyed as we know it. All of New York City is just one heap of rubble. There are fires everywhere. Thousands of people are running in every direction frantically. The Hudson River has overflowed many areas of the city. Smoke is billowing up everywhere. As far as I can see, the land has been leveled. It was twilight. Fireballs were in the sky, heading for the earth. It was the end of the world, total destruction of everything that man and his civilization had built up. 
The cause of this great destruction was a race of great giants, giants who had come from outer space, from the far reaches of the universe. In the middle of the rubble, I could see two of them sitting. They were casually scooping up people by the handful and eating them. All of this was done with the same nonchalance that we have when we sit down at table and eat grapes by the handful. The sight was awesome. The giants were not all the same size or quite the same structure. Our guide explained that the giants were from different planets and lived harmoniously and peacefully together. The guide also explained that the giants landed in flying saucers. The fireballs were nothing were other landings. In fact, the earth as we know it was conceived by this race of giants in the beginning of time as we know it. They cultivated our civilization like we could cultivate vegetables in a hothouse. The earth was their hothouse, so to speak, and now they are returned to reap the fruits they had sown. But there was a special occasion for all this which I wasn't to become aware of till later. I was saved because I had slightly high blood pressure. If I had normal blood pressure, or if my blood pressure was too high, I would have been eaten like almost all the others. Because I had slightly high blood pressure, hypertension, I am chosen to go through this ordeal, and if I pass the ordeal, I would become like my guide, a saver of souls. We walked for an extraordinarily long time, witnessing all the cataclysmic destruction. Then before me, I saw a huge golden throne. It was as brilliant as the sun, impossible to view straight on. On the throne sat a king and his queen of the race of giants. They were the intelligence behind the destruction of our planet, as I know it. There was something special or extraordinary about them, which I didn't become aware of till later. The ordeal or task I had to perform, in addition to witnessing the world's destruction, was to climb up this staircase until I was at their level, face to face with them. This was probably in stages. I started climbing. It was long and very difficult. My heart was pounding very hard. I felt frightened but knew I had to accomplish this task. The world and humanity were at stake. I woke up from this dream persisting heavily, perspiring heavily. Later I realized that the destruction of the earth by the race of giants was a wedding feast for the newly united king and queen. This was the special occasion and the extraordinary feeling I had about the king and queen. Dreams of this sort will go to make up the scriptures of the new myth. This is not a personal dream and must not be interpreted personalistically. It is a collective dream expressing the state of the collective psyche. Eight days before his death, Jung spoke of having had a vision in which a large part of the world was destroyed, but he added, thank God, not all of it. Years before, he had written of the mood of universal destruction and renewal that has set its mark on our age. This mood makes itself felt everywhere, politically, socially, and philosophically. We are living in what the Greeks called the kairos, the right moment, for a metamorphosis of the gods, of the, fight, of the fundamental principles and symbols. The dream I have presented portrays this mood of universal destruction and renewal. Strikingly, it uses the same image of harvest as appears in Revelation, where one angel says to another, put your sickle in and reap. Harvest time has come and the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then the one sitting on the cloud set his sickle to work on the earth, and the earth's har harvest was reaped. Revelation 14. 14 to 16. Now, I think it's very remarkable that that particular image um, sounds very much like 9-11, but this book uh, was written, uh, let me see, it's copyrighted in uh, 1992, I believe, 
um, cannot find the copy. Oh, copyright 1984. So Dr. Edinger wrote this book in 1984, um, and he died in 1998. So he could not possibly have even been aware of the crash of the Twin Towers in Manhattan on 9-11. And nonetheless, this dream is almost exactly predictive of that event. <clears throat> what does it mean to be eaten by giants or to be harvested by angels? It means that one has been swallowed up by archetypal non-human dynamisms. The autonomous ego whose separate stance over and against instinct and archetype is the sine qua non of consciousness has fallen into a fatal identification with the archetypes. For the individual, this means either psychosis or criminal psychop psychopathy. For a society, it means structural disintegration and general collective demoralization brought about by the loss of the central myth, which had supported and justified the burdensome task of being human. In Yeats's word, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So it was in the declining days of the Roman Empire to which Revelation refers, and so it threatens to be today. The dreamer was saved from his, this fate because he had slightly high blood pressure. This was not an external fact, and there were no personal associations. So we are left with general symbolism. Blood is the life essence but in particular it refers to the effect life, desirousness, passion, violence. Passionate intensity is dangerous, as Yeats implies in his phrase, the blood didn't tide of, is loosed. Too high a blood pressure would perhaps indicate a greater intensity of primitive effect than can be assimilated by the ego. Such a person would be consumed by the primitive archetypal energies, giants on contact with them. Normal blood pressure, on the other hand, suggests a bland lack of reaction to the abnormal times. It is correct for modern man to be disturbed, to be slightly high blood pressure. It indicates his inner alarm system is still intact and there is some chance for him. His anxiety will spur him to reflection and effort that may be life-saving. A complacent attitude, on the contrary, lulls one into a false sense of security, so one is quite unprepared for the encounter with the activated collective unconscious invasions of the giants. Climbing up the staircase belongs to the alchemical symbolism of sublimatio, of sublimatio. This operation involves the transfer of material from the bottom of the flask to the top through volatilization. Psychologically, it refers to the process whereby personal, particular problems, conflicts, and happenings are understood from a height from a larger perspective as aspects of a greater process under the aspect of eternity. Once the staircase has been climbed, the dreamer will meet the enthroned king and queen face to face. This is a profound image of the process of encountering and enduring the union of opposites. It is a labor laborious task as the dream makes clear but it is the only way to avoid being consumed by the activated archetypes. The opposites are initially experienced as painful and paralyzing conflicts, but enduring and working on such conflicts promote the creation of consciousness and may lead to a glimpse of the self as a conjunctio. As Jung says, all opposites are of God, Therefore, man must bend to this burden, and in so doing, he finds that God in his oppositeness has taken possession of him, incarnated himself in him. He becomes a vessel filled with divine conflict. This is precisely the divine service which man can render to God, and which, according to this dream, is what's required for salvation.
Another product of the sublimatio process has come to my attention. It is a woman's vision showing how the history of humanity might look from an immense height and distance. Quote, I saw the earth covered by a single great tree whose multiple roots fed on the inner sun of gold, the lumen naturae. It was a tree whose limbs were made of light and the branches were lovingly entangled so that it made of itself a network of beauteous love. And it seemed as if it were lifting itself out of the broken seeds of many, countless egos who had now allowed the one self to break forth, and one beheld this, the sun and the moon and the planets turned out to be something quite, quite other than one had thought. From what I could make out, the Lord himself was the alchemist, and out of the collective swarming of, and suffering, ignorance and pollution, he was trying the gold. A notable feature of the new myth is its capacity to unify the various current religions of the world. By seeing all functioning religions as living expressions of individuation symbolism, i.e. the process of creating consciousness, an authentic basis is laid for true ecumenical attitude. The new myth will not be one more will not be one more religious myth in competition with all the others for man's allegiance. Rather, it will elucidate and verify every functioning religion by giving more conscious and comprehensive expression to its essential meaning. The new myth can be understood and lived within one of the great religious communities, such as Catholic Christianity, Pro Protestant Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, etc., or in some new community yet to be created, or by individuals without specific community connections. This universal application gives it a genuine claim to the term Catholic. That's Catholic with a small c. For the first time in history, we now have an understanding of man so comprehensive and fundamental for the first time in history, we have an understanding of man so comprehensive and fundamental that it can be the basis for unification of the world, first religiously and culturally, and then in time, politically. When enough individuals are carriers of the consciousness of wholeness, the world itself will become whole. In summary, I have traced the outlines of a new myth which I believe is emerging from the life and work of Jung. <coughs> this, <coughs> I'll read that again, sorry for the cough. In summary, I have traced the outlines of a new myth, which I believe is emerging from the life and work of Jung. This myth is not a faith, but an hypothesis based on empirical data and consistent with the scientific conscience. The new myth tells us that each individual ego is a crucible for the creation of consciousness and a vessel to serve as a carrier of that consciousness, i.e., a vessel for the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> i.e. a vessel for the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. The individual psyche is the Holy Grail, made holy by what it contains. Conscious consciousness is a psychic substance which is produced by the experience of the opposite suffered, not blindly, but in living awareness. This experience is the conjunctio, the mysterium conjunctionis that generates the philosopher's stone, which symbolizes consciousness. Each individual is, to a greater or a lesser extent, a participant in cosmic creation, one of the buckets of the great Manichaean wheel of light, who contributes his widow's might to the cumulative treasury of the archetypal psyche realized. 
every human experience to the extent that it is lived in awareness augments the sum total of consciousness in the universe. This fact provides the meaning for every experience and gives each individual a role in the ongoing world drama of creation. Okay, so that is the end of chapter one. So thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you for chapter two, uh, hopefully tomorrow. And now I'm going to go watch online the BTS concert in Wembley Stadium. I'm looking forward to that.